Our guest today, Darren DeStefano, is a partner of Cooley out in Reston, Virginia. Darren and I used to work together at the SEC in the SEC's Division of Corporation Finance, and he's been doing deals for the last two decades, and recently did a very interesting deal for Vital Farms, an IPO of a certified B Corp. I'm Brock Romanek, today on Zippy Point. So, Darren, can you give us an overview of the Public Benefit Corporation? I'm not that familiar with it. I remember I have blogged about them a little bit here and there over the years, but it just hasn't been more for my forte. What are those all about? Sure. So, uh, Public Benefit Corporations, and, and they kind of come by different names, uh, depending on which state you're, you're dealing with. But in Delaware, they're, they're called Public Benefit Corporations, or corporations where the boards of directors actually have a broader mandate than simply maximizing value for stockholders. The traditional um, fiduciary responsibilities of boards of directors, of course, uh, for a corporation are maximizing the value of stockholders. And, and ultimately, uh, they'll be judged based on how well they go about doing that and, and then there's there's different standards of of their um of their duties depending on what types of um uh, transactions or, or or circumstances they face but in um but in the public benefit corporation which is actually a separate uh component of the delaware general corporation law um establishes uh, uh public benefit corporations which are in fact simply an election um, as, as a technical matter, so any co corporation uh, incorporated in Delaware can elect to be uh, treated as a public benefit corporation. Uh, those those boards of directors have a broader mandate to um, to, to not only consider uh, the uh, interest of stockholders, which they continue to have that responsibility, but they balance uh, that um, uh, that interest of stockholders with additional interests that are defined in the charter um, and so in fulfilling their fiduciary responsibilities they are not necessarily guided by what's going to maximize value to stockholders but really rather what's going to in, in totality um, uh, be in the best interest of the various stakeholders that are defined into the the charter which could include employees it could include the environment it could include animals it could include really anything uh, that that the company wants to build into uh, build into the charter. So that so that's what a public benefit corporation is. And again, they have different names in in different uh, in different states. And some states don't actually even have that in their corporate corporate code. But in Delaware, it's it's a relatively recent relatively recent uh, addition to the code. And we're starting to see more and more companies elect public benefit corporation status in Delaware. Are companies using Delaware? Like they would for a traditional public company in that since the law is more developed there or the courts are more business savvy that they elect to be a delaware public benefit corporation compared to other states it's an interesting question the, the and one of the things we struggled with a little bit uh in the in the ipo that we'll talk about um is there is isn't really a lot of developed law as it relates to matters having to do with the specific public benefit corporation election um, and so there's some uncertainty as to how that might get played out in a, say, a breach of fiduciary duty lawsuit or something like that. That said, the companies are, are, are still completely comfortable going into Delaware. Um, all, of the, all of the corporate law, all of the history, all of the case law and all that sort of stuff that um, nevertheless continues to, to by and large apply. Companies who are growing, you know, that sort of thing, doing venture financing, et cetera. Are, are still very comfortable being in Delaware for a lot of those reasons, even if there's not a lot of developed law around the specific, the specific you know, aspects that have to do with treating public benefit corporations differently than, say, a traditional Delaware corporation. Uh, but it's, but it's, it's Delaware by and large. I mean, you see some in California um, as well, but for the most part, it's Delaware. So how would you compare and contrast a public benefit corporation with a certified B Corp? Sure, and and I think a lot of people brought get those concepts confused, or they conflate them a little bit. There's an independent standard setting organization called B Labs. B Labs has as its mission advancing, you know, uh, uh, societal agendas uh, and and th through um, corporations, right? And so what they think of B Labs is say almost like a like a like an ISO 9000 certification or something right they they go in and evaluate the companies based on their ESG uh performance and and, and those sorts of uh, of things 
and they will certify you as a certified B Corp stamp of approval, if you will. As a condition of being certified as a, a certified B Corp, the company is required to have a legal mandate uh, to balance the interests of multiple stakeholders and not just stockholders. And so within um, B Labs legal certification requirements, depending on where you're organized, and by the way, certified B corporations can be uh, all over the world, um, not just in the United States, not just in Delaware. And so depending on which state of incorporation or which jurisdiction of organization, if you're outside the U.S., that you are, uh, there's different standards uh, that you have to meet from, a, from purely from a legal perspective in order to, to, to qualify. And so for most states in the United States, uh, and this would be um, certainly true for Delaware, it, the obligation is to uh, elect public benefit corporation status or, the, or its equivalent whatever it happens to be called in that, in that state. So you are, you are required to take that corporate action to avail yourselves of those broader uh, fiduciary responsibilities within your state of incorporation. That's just one condition of being a certified B Corp uh, by B Labs. And then they have a, a long questionnaire and they evaluate your business operations and things of that nature. But what you will see is as an absolute condition of being a certified B Corp, in the case of a Delaware corporation, you'd have to be also a public benefit corporation under Delaware law. They actually do give companies a period of time to elect that status, so um, and it's two years. So if if uh, if let's say you're a, a, a Delaware corporation and you want to be a certified B Corp, they will give you certified B Corp status on the condition that within two years you convert your corporation to elect public benefit corporation status and. There, there, there is one example of a, co a company that went public as a, as a certified B Corp with, a, with an undertaking to elect uh, public benefit corporation status, and then they, they uh, decided it was too much trouble and didn't do it. Uh, and then they forego, they, they forewent their, their certified B Corp status. But in the case of Bot Farms, for example, and a couple of others, they're, they're both a public beneficial corporation under Delaware law and a certified B Corp by B Labs. Do you have any idea what the relative popularity of how many public benefit corporations elect to try to become a certified B? Well, it's certainly in vogue to, uh, to get the certification. As I said, it's a real stamp of approval uh, for these companies. It's a very recognized um, mark. I'd say that the goal of pretty much every company that elects public benefit corporation a status under Delaware law is to be a certified B corporation because that's the that's the thing that gets you the, the cool little logo on your website. That's the thing that, that probably is a little bit more consumer facing rather than legal facing. When we've seen that, we, we see companies going, going for the, the, the public benefit corporation status under Delaware law as a condition of trying to get the certified B Corp set for the most part. So as I understand it, there's only a handful of, of public benefit corporations that have gone public that are publicly held on an IPO. Was it three, maybe four? Yeah. I'm not, I haven't, and it's all in the last five years. So it's been very gradual. I think the first one was three or four years ago. And then there's been the slow drip, including Vital Farms, which is the IPO that, that you just helped usher in. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about the basics of, of a publicly held uh, PBC and certified B Corp? Sure, sure. I, I think, Brock, first of all, it's like with, like with most things, I think new things are, are you know, folks are a little bit slow to, slow to embrace. I, I, one of the things that we've seen, certainly we saw it through the Vital Farms IPO and, and are seeing just more, more, um, more generally now across our, across our client base, is a real embracing of the notion that we used to, you know, used to say, you know, it is possible you know, to do well by doing good. And that, you know, that there is, there is now such a growing sort of what, what the B labs you call the B economy, right? The, the, there, there are consumers who really care about these other interests besides pure profit um, maximization on the part of the companies with which they do business. And so, so slowly you're starting to see this now become, you know, something that uh, venture capitalists are comfortable with. Uh, that, that that management teams are comfortable with, boards of directors, et cetera. And so I think I think this is just it is a I, my prediction is that this is going to to to, to snowball. Um, but it was just a, a little slow slow go at the outset. You're right. There's there's three publicly held uh, public benefit corporations, uh, all, all of which are certified B corporations as well. 
the first was Laureate Education, then the second and third, which basically came in relatively contemporaneously, Vital Farms and Lemonade. But I can tell you, you know, somewhat confidently at the moment, there's, there, there's any number that are, you know, sort of shortly behind those that are coming. Difference between the process of taking a, a, a traditional uh, corporation public versus a, a public benefit corporation, for the most part, the process is, is quite similar, really not a lot different. Um, but, but there were a few issues that we had to grapple with uh, that we, um, you know, dealt with kind of through the disclosure process, the, the most significant of which is the uh, fiduciary duty issue. There's, and, there's a, and the fiduciary issue has a couple of components to it. You know, the, the, the first one is that unlike um, most uh, public companies that, uh, that someone would invest in, they could have the confidence that the board of directors is charged with maximizing uh, stockholder value. Um, and that they basically would have a, effectively a claim against the board of directors for failure to do that. In the context of public benefit corporation, that's not always uh, the case because, again, under the, the, the charter, under the public benefit corporation law, the board is actually charged with balancing the interests of stockholders with these other interests of different stakeholders. Okay, in the case of Vital Farms, you know, those stakeholders you know, are, 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 are basically the public mission, bringing ethically produced food to the table bringing joy to cons consumers and their products. So actually, the consumers themselves are part of the fiduciary responsibilities of the, of the corporation, it's something that the traditional corporation doesn't really have. Um, allowing their employees to have an empowering, fun environment. I mean, th these are provisions of the company's actual charter. And then fostering partnerships with farmers, suppliers, being stewards of animals, land, the environment. So all of these things are what the board of directors actually, when they go into a, a decision-making process, they are obligated under, under uh, the corporate law of Delaware to consider those, those interests and balance them as they're making decisions. So in the context of the IPO and the disclosures that we, uh, we built out, we, we needed to think about that. We needed to advise stockholders and investors in the company that um, while it's, 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 it's not at all atypical for a board of directors to do something that a, that a stockholder doesn't uh, believe are necessarily in the company's best interest or in the stockholder's best interest. That could be a difference of opinion. In, in the case of public benefit corporation, in fact, that can be perfectly fine as long as they are appropriately balancing these other interests. And so, so that was one issue from the fiduciary perspective that, that, that we built up a lot. So you'll see that you know, appearing throughout the prospectus. And then the second, and then I think a lesser consideration, but, a, but another fiduciary consideration is, well, what if they don't? Like, what if they don't consider the interests of the animals? What if they don't consider the interests of the environment? What if they don't consider the interests of their customers? They actually have a fiduciary responsibility to do those things. The way the law works is only a stockholder is entitled to bring a fiduciary claim. We, Delaware did not create a new class of plaintiffs for bringing a fiduciary duty lawsuit. So, so an animal can't show up in court and say, hey, you didn't look out for, you know, my interest as a chicken. But certainly a stockholder could, you know. So if, if you had a, a very strong ESG uh, oriented investor that felt like, hey, you didn't do enough for the environment, there is potentially lurking there not only a claim around maybe a tort or something like that where you might traditionally have have a, a claim, but in fact, actually now a fiduciary lawsuit uh, for the failure to appropriately consider these things that under your charter, you're obligated, you know, under Delaware law to consider when you're making decisions. So, so those are really two different fiduciary concerns. None of it's really worked its way through the courts yet, of course. So it's almost anybody's guess how, how that all would ultimately play out in the case of, a, of an actual claim. Um, but so we, we've got risk factor disclosure pretty pretty prominent in the perspectives to deal to deal with that so there let's talk about the disclosure issues because you've worked for decades on traditional ipo prospectuses and now you had a sort you're working on a certified b prospectus something that's unique and novel what are the disclosure issues how are how are what sections of the prospectus are different in in a way that you had to pause and rethink what what you would normally do sure brock um in in consideration for the different of the, of the different fiduciary responsibilities, and, and that we did think was the most critical uh, difference between a traditional traditional 
Delaware Corporation and a B Corp or a public benefit corporation. We, we spent the, the, probably the biggest chunk of our energy on that. Um, so within the risk factors, we, we spent some good real estate talking about this is how um, a board of directors, fiduciary responsibilities differ in, in a public benefit corporation versus a traditional corporation, and particularly uh, pointing out the fact that in consideration of the fact that the, that the board is uh, required to balance the interests of multiple stakeholders and, and multiple interests and not just those stockholders, that um, there is heightened risk uh, that in actually fulfilling the board's fiduciary duties, they may affirmatively elect to do something that's not in the best interest necessarily of stockholders. Now, that said, just a side note, it's not at all the board's intention to do things that aren't in the interest of stockholders. Um, so I just want to make make it clear that uh, you know this isn't uh, this isn't a situation where the board's going to to not consider the interest of stockholders. In fact, it's, it's still the, the primary consideration of the board. But they are required to balance these other interests. So so we spend time focusing on that issue, um, and, and so that put, pops up in in risk factors. In consideration for the significance of that issue. There's also actually disclosure right on the cover of the prospectus. Um, and in, in as much as the SEC is big fans, um, uh, as you know, of uh, bringing important stuff to the attention to the reader early, um, uh, we, we just have it right on the cover of the prospectus that, you know, they've, they've elected to be treated as a public benefit corporation and that, uh, you know, has implications for the way the board will make decisions or potentially could. There are also other anti-takeover uh, provisions uh, that, under the public benefit corporation uh, statute, there, you, you, you do need a particular uh, stockholder approval in order to de-elect the public benefit corporation um, uh, status or to change it or to merge it with another company that, um, that has a, a different public benefit. So, it just creates it creates an additional protection in the um, in in the Delaware General Corporation Law for the actual mission of these public benefit corporations, and so there is some disclosure also uh, in the risk factors as well as in the description of capital stock where we talk about we talk about those those uh, provisions of Delaware law. Other sections, although we we, we spend some time in the summary uh, of the prospectus, just mentioning the fiduciary issue. As, as one of the key risks that, that stockholders should consider. Um, uh, and, and we spent a little bit of, of space just generally describing both public benefit corporation and, um, and certified B Corp status uh, in, the, in the prospectus summary. Otherwise, the rest of the prospectus, by and large, Brock looks you know, like you would a traditional IPO with uh, business and MDNA really focusing on just the you know the business and the, the financial performance and, and and drivers of the company and, and MDNA that you would typically see in in, in the IPO. And Darren, when I first looked at the prospectus, I noticed right away that there was this founder chairs letter, and you know seems pretty unique for an IPO prospectus. What was the thinking behind that? P pretty unique, although I would say it's it's in, it's becoming more common both in the case of a benefit corporation, but more broadly. So, so you are seeing those a little more. A little more frequently, it's the ability, um, whether it's the chairman or it's the CEO or a founder, and in, that, in the case of Auto Farms, the founder and, and executive chairman. It's the ability uh, of, of those individuals to put a little bit more of a personal spin, put the put the mission of the company in their own words. In in the case of Auto Farms, uh, it was it was really important uh, to Matt uh, to be able to communicate to to the investing public. What's coming was really about to him, why he started it, what his, what his uh, mission was in, in, in founding the company and, and the decisions that drive that company every day, what gets them kind of out of bed every morning. And, um, and, and I, I, I think it was actually a fantastic letter. Not surprisingly, we did debate whether we should include it or not, uh, as lawyers are, are apt to do. And, uh, and I think um, in the case of a public benefit corporation, I think it's fair to say you probably have a little more latitude to do something like that. And, and the reason I say that is because in, in consideration for the broader fiduciary mandate of the board of directors, it's, it's, it's okay to say, to have your chairman come out and say, hey, we really care about the environment. We really care about these things. Um, whereas, uh, you know, you might be a little more nervous about that um, if, uh, if, if you didn't kind of have that slightly broader 
uh, fiduciary responsibility. Um, but but again, that you're seeing them pop up more, with more frequency. And, and the, the the other the other thing w- that I think was actually um, very very effective was the ability to communicate for the company to communicate with ESG focused investors. And and I think I think that letter, you know, we put it right up at the front of the business section. That thing popped uh, in in investors' minds. You know, I I think I probably historically would have thought, ah, people are just gonna you know, flip the page, you know, not paying attention to it. And I don't think that was the case. I think I think people really loved hearing what this company is about in the words of the founder, executive chairman, I know by the way, largest stockholder. Hearing his words, I think, did a good job of conveying, hey, what as an investor, what am I getting myself into and who am I getting into it with? And and obviously, you know, the success of the IPO, I think it's proof that absolutely did did work so you had a road show during covid and that's always going to be challenging and different but how else would you compare and contrast a b corp versus a traditional ipo road show you know as, as the lawyers we're we're a little bit on the sidelines in terms of the actual mechanics of the, of the, the road show and you know how it, how it goes that sort of thing and at the end of the process we <clears throat> sort of see the uh, the bankers uh, lift the curtain and you, and you see the success of the marketing effort, you're right. The COVID environment roadshow, which is its whole its its own thing, was very was very different. Uh, I've now gone through a few of those. What we saw, um, without getting too much into into the details, um, is is this very broad participation on the part of investors, particularly those with ESG focus, that maybe Brock traditionally wouldn't have been buying in a lot of IPOs, frankly. And so I think what they 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 were able to do. And I think this is owing to the to the um, to the success of the company as well as just a, just a very well developed um, strategy for for marketing the offering. They were able to bring in the traditional IPO investors that you would see in every deal, um, but but also have a very strong, robust um, ESG focused investor base. And so the combination of those two things they made for a very successful successful roadshow and. And, and, I, and I think that's a trend that's likely to continue as, as more and more money goes into these ESG-focused investors. So looking into the future, Darren, do you think this vital farms IPO is the beginning of a wave of public benefit corporation IPOs? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how big the wave is going to be, um, but I, I definitely think that the rate at which we see these things is going to increase in the, in the near future. There's just... Um, there just really is a, a significant amount of uh, interest, um, and and you and you you hear it in the in the broader narrative just in society, right? I mean, the, the focus on um, you know the sort of big bad corporations and, and those sorts of things. So, um, it, it, it's this idea that that um, that companies that have uh, have and, and do take seriously um, their responsibilities to the community or the environment or or to employees or, or, or consumers, um, it's just something that's going to resonate and continue to resonate more broadly. Um, and and that's not that's a trend that's not going to change. Um, and in as much as as those sort of broader societal trends um, are um, are driving behaviors, um, it it would be uh, it would just be natural to expect more of these companies to to start to, to access the capital markets. At the same time, I just say more anecdotally. Uh, we have uh, Cooley, and I'm sure it's true, uh, among other uh, other uh, law firms that are that are uh, counseling high growth companies. Just you're seeing just increasing numbers of privately held companies that are public benefit corporations, and so um, I can see those companies coming to the market. So it's it's not just a broader societal thing that I'm observing. It's actually knowing those companies are out there and they're and they're moving towards it. Are you going to see a day where, where you know, fifty percent of the the companies going public are, are PVCs? I doubt it. Um, but um, but I definitely think certainly as we get more comfortable with it, um, and you start to see the successes of you know of you know, Vital Farms and Lemonade, um, that that will you know kind of just further um, uh, give a give a validity to the to the to, to the IPO for PVC as opposed to saying hey. It was great that we were a public benefit corporation up until the IPO. Let's kind of revoke that status now as we go public. I think those companies will feel more comfortable just going public as PPCs 
Um, so yeah, I, I think stay tuned. I think I think maybe um, uh, in a year or two we'll look back and and we'll say yeah that was kind of the beginning of of, of a bit of a trend. Um, I guess remains to be seen, but that would be my bet. Yeah, you never know. I mean, the the wave of specs right now amazes me because you know, it's kind of almost all out of the blue. Um, so things right. come and go, and some things never die, perhaps, or they die and they come back. <laughs> you watch the TV. Done that. Things always come. Back. <laughs> Character always comes back. They've been dead for two seasons, and all of a sudden they're back. Yeah, yeah, right. That was great, Darren. Thanks very much. Ah, my pleasure, Brock. Thank you. Mm -hmm.